I set the expectation that I didn't expect people to respond to email 24 hours a day. I took vacations. I went to the doctor when I needed to, and I set these expectations for my staff and their teams. Welcome to the Leader's Mindset, where we bring you illuminating conversations with leaders who are making an impact in business and our communities. Today, we're talking to Brad Englert, who is an author, advisor, and technologist, and has a new book out called Spheres of Influence, where he shows us how to create and nurture authentic business relationships. It's an Amazon bestseller in the leadership training, mentoring and coaching, and customer relations categories, which is no surprise because Brad's got over 40 years of experience in the private and public sector, including 10 years as a partner at Accenture and seven years as the chief information officer at University oh, of pleasure. Texas at Austin. Thanks for joining us today, Brad. And thanks to you all for watching. Go ahead and like comment, share right now so we can reach as many people as possible. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our interviews with remarkable leaders like Brad. So let's get started, Brad. Let's get into it. What was the light bulb moment that sparked your passion for building powerful business relationships? And how did that lead you well, really to your new book, Spheres of Influence? I joined uh, Arthur Anderson, which became Anderson Consulting, <clears throat> which became Accenture. And they were I was coached from day one that I should build relationships with my peers and my customers because over time, they, as they grow in their careers and I grow in my career, uh, well, 20, 30 years later, we might be at the same level. And the person I started with on my first assignment became the chief information officer of a large state agency in Texas the same year I became a CIO at the University of Texas in Austin. And we've stayed in touch for 25, 30 years. So it, was, it actually came true. Yeah, I mean, I think we all kind of know intuitively relationships are everything when it comes to business. Uh, and, and that does coexist with objective merit-based yep. uh, business and promotion and that kind of thing. So looking back at the start of your career, what was the biggest misconception you had about leadership and how has your view of building well, relationships of, evolved uh, over time? You know, early in my career, I kind of, uh, worked too hard <laughs> and I, I, uh, wasn't really a good role model. And my partner at, uh, at an annual review pulled me aside and goes, look, I don't want you to be a bad influence on the rest of your staff. Stop working so hard. <laughs> and it, it uh, also not only being a good role model, but it, it enabled me to have more balance in my life. And, but it was, uh, you know, working hard, and uh, not being aware of your impact on your staff, that was a good revelation that served me well throughout my career. I, I saw that during my time in the Air Force as well, especially when I was working at the headquarters level. The generals would stick around to do work because it was kind of the only time they could really get any work done, read things, catch up on things. And so a lot of folks thought that because the general was sticking around the one star, the three star, right. the four star, that they needed to be there as well. And it led to a lot of people sticking around, kind of kind of doing busy work. And I didn't have a problem with that, but it led mm. to a lot of people creating busy work for other people. So it's it's really important as a leader to be conscious of the the impact you have on your own staff, the people who are working for you. It's great to be a hard charger, to be driven, to get things done. Just understand what what well, people the what people take away from that when oh, they see okay, that. Sorry. Also, when I was in the I, I was going to say when I became no, go, go chief ahead, information go ahead. officer, I set the expectation that I didn't expect people to respond to email twenty four hours a day. I took vacations. I went to the doctor when I needed to, and I set these expectations for my staff and their teams, because you can work 24 hours in IT, you know, there, there's no stopping it. But I can't compete with private sector companies here in Austin, Texas, 
on salary. So I have to compete on balance of life. And that's what I wanted to make sure uh, that people had balance. I had one network engineer leave to go to a startup. And I said, look, I don't say this for everybody, but if you don't like it, you can come back. Well, two weeks later, he came back and said, well, they feed me and do my dry cleaning because I never go home and see my family. <laughs> can I come back? And I said, yeah, you can come back. And he's still with us. Yeah, there are real practical implications uh, and practical reasons to really make sure that people are getting that work-life balance and we're setting a good example. So also when I was in the Air Force, mm -hmm. we talked about spheres of influence geopolitically, but your book, Spheres of Influence, introduces a fresh take on relationships. So how does it flip the script on what we well, think about influence two in business? Of influence. Those relationships that are closest to you, and those would be your boss, your direct reports, executive leaders, and all your staff. And then you have an external sphere of influence where you have less direct impact. Those would be your customers, peers and influencers, and strategic vendor partners. And in all those relationships, there are three principles that apply. Number one, you need to understand their goals and aspirations. I mean, who doesn't want to share that with their, their uh, direct reports and their boss? Um, second, set and manage expectations. Common sense, but often we don't take the time to set and manage those expectations. And then third, genuinely care about their success. Yeah, those are those are a lot of things that we talk about that often get lost when it comes into practice. And they're so important to to apply those three principles and really to live those three principles if we want to have successful relationships with our boss and with right. our with our peers and our other leadership. Why is managing up the secret sauce to success that most people, including myself, only learn the hard way? And why did you kick your book off with that in well, a relationship with I your direct boss? I believe that some people are afraid to approach their boss. Um, I had someone who <clears throat> told me about a situation where their boss, all of a sudden, after a couple of years, started boxing them out of meetings and not listening to their ideas. And after about three weeks, he got some time on the boss's calendar and said, am I doing something wrong? And the boss goes, oh, I have trouble at home. I didn't realize I was bringing it to the workplace. He had the courage to ask the boss. Some people would suffer in silence. Some people would quit. So I, I think just having the courage to ask your boss, what are your goals and aspirations, and how can I help you achieve those? That's, I always welcome that with my direct reports. Yeah, there's a lot of great tips in the book for what you can do with your boss. And I found, you know, I, I went through a similar thing when I was a flight commander in the Air Force, a brand new flight commander in the Air Force as a captain. I had to start to learn to look out for the signs that there might be something going on at home with the, with the folks who are working for me. And it's something we don't always think about with our boss. It's, it's something we, <clears throat> we think about, okay, I need to look for that for the people on my team. But sometimes we forget that our our bosses aren't uh, infallible and invulnerable, and they may be going That's through right. things yeah. outside of the and workplace environment as well. I had a type well. A personality boss. Everything was urgent and had to be done right away. At least I thought so. And one uh, afternoon, I was trying to leave to meet my wife for dinner, and literally 5 o'clock, the phone rings, and it's the partner. And she goes, I need a white paper. A white paper. And I literally said, whoa. I didn't say no, because no would set her off like a rocket. But I said, whoa. Well, and I said, when do you need this white paper? Oh, oh, let me check my calendar. I need it in two weeks. I was thinking the next day. Um, how many pages do you want this white paper to be? Oh, uh, three pages. I was thinking 10. Uh, do you have an example of white paper that I could use? Oh, yeah, yeah. Ask David. I did one on XYZ Corporation 10 years ago. Guess what? I went home. Now, before I learned to say, whoa, I would have called my wife and canceled dinner, upsetting her and me. I would have stayed up all night writing a 10-page white paper, <laughs> and I'd give it to my boss the next day, and she'd probably yell at me because it didn't meet her expectations. 
you know, it's a lose, lose, lose situation. So once I learned to say, whoa, even with your customers, uh, you just get to a better place. Yeah, it's a lesson I also learned in the hard way in the Air Force to uh, to learn to ask when when do we have time with the general to talk to them about this? Because if it's not for two That's weeks, right. That's right. it can probably at least wait till the morning, right? Uh, so it's important important to ask the right questions. If your boss is a real hard charger, make sure you're understanding the big picture, the strategic laydown of things, and and uh, right. and uh, ask the right questions to get to the right answers. So I also found when I was in the Air Force that my success was directly tied mm. to the quality of the relationships I had with my peers. What's the hidden superpower of peer relationships and how have they shaped well, your the success throughout your career? Um, it's a very large organization, 54,000 students, 4,000 faculty, 21,000 staff. And my peers were responsible for public safety. They were responsible for all the buildings on campus, 16 million square feet. Um, all those buildings need IT, so I need to be talking with them. Um, we actually generated our own electricity. Um, and so I would meet with my peers and say, what can I do to help you be successful? And let's just start with public safety. It wasn't a matter of if something would go wrong, it's when it would go wrong and how do we work together. And we had a bomb scare, we had a murder, we had a shooting. and. In any of those crisis situations, we have an emergency operations center. We <clears throat> coordinate with the leadership of the university and the public safety and police uh, organization. And so we just made, we would uh, test drive that process to make sure we we're ready when things got bad. The bomb scare, I was actually outside on the mall with just my phone, but I was able to get onto the conference bridge with leadership and we handled it from the mall outside. Excellent. Yeah, we, it's, you know, it's always great to practice. It's always great to, to work through those things so that we can handle a whole bunch of different problems when the actual emergency yeah. comes, but it's, it's great to be forward leaning like that. How can you leave a lasting impression on decision makers in just a few minutes? What's your go-to strategy for pitching to higher ups and building those relationships when you may not see well, that person all, very often? I need to understand what the strategy is for my organization. It seems simple, but a lot of people don't take the time to do the research and find out, well, what is the purpose of this organization? And the good thing in public sector and private sector, that's often a very public statement of what is our strategy, uh, what are our values, what is our mission, and how do we, you know, prioritize. And so if you know before you're meeting with executive leadership what the overall strategy is, you can ask yourself, well, how could I help in that and help them with that? The dirty little secret is some organizations do not have a strategy, and then it becomes difficult. And what I what you do is you help them build a strategy. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. If you don't have a strategy, it's real hard to communicate it to your team. It's real hard to communicate it all down the line. I saw a statistic, something like only like 5% of employees know and understand wow. what their company's big picture strategy is and right. not not like the marketing strategy not like the sales strategy not like the communication strategy like the big picture what do we do in the world what do we bring into the world and make the world a better place with only five percent of employees uh, understand that and know that and that's something that's on us as leaders is to make sure everybody working for us understands the big picture right. and for that to happen we need to understand it ourselves and like you said that's a lot of that is public information. Now, whether what's publicly mm -hmm. said is what's actually practiced is entirely different, yeah, but you, you can at least start the there and, with the public statements. Uh, when I got to the university, they didn't really have an, uh, their values articulated. It was a central IT group that was into heroics. So when things would break, you know, they'd swoop in and and uh, and they were rewarded for heroics and fire drills. And that's kind of the opposite of my approach. So to change the culture to be a proactive customer-oriented culture, 
not a reactive, <laughs> heroic culture. We are articulated the values of the organization. Number one was family first. You know, if your kid has a school play, go to the play. We have 330 people to back you up. Um, second was be truthful. Uh, the central group wasn't always truthful in the past, so we want to be truthful. Collaborative, work with those on campus to come up with the solutions. Uh, we actually had the students and faculty pick some of the tools that we use in the classroom. So when it got to the president and he said, well, what do the faculty and students think? Well, they selected it and they're unanimously recommending we do it. <laughs> so it, it's just a matter of um, articulating the values and then, um, you know, walking the walk. We had an orientation that anyone joining the organization had to meet with the leadership team. We would talk through the values. And every once in a while, someone would try to sneak out and not, not come to the orientation because they're, quote, too busy. And we would invite them to the next monthly orientation. <laughs> no one went onto the floor of the, the shop without going through the orientation to understand the values. And then I wrote a weekly blog that would reinforce those values and give examples of where someone on the staff uh, emulated those values. Uh, sometimes we screwed up and I would apologize. This blog went out to 330 people in my organization and about 300 people interested in IT at UT. And that helped open up the lines of communication both ways, because they would respond to me and say, hey, I saw that blog. Um, you might want to think about this. And so it's really a valuable way to reinforce the values and change the culture. It, it sounds amazing. It sounds like you really got those defined clearly, communicated out clearly, and that there was a great response to it. One of the things that always has, I've always been frustrated by the culture of heroic because, because heroics sound like a really great thing, but tell us why a culture of heroics is a trap that could backfire in your organization. And you, you told us what to focus on instead, the values and the communication, but why, why is heroics well, a bad thing? Um, you're depending on, in many cases, single points of failure. And if you have one person who, can fix something and they're not available, then you can have a catastrophic situation. And uh, one of the tools in uh, education is the learning management system. So it's all the courses have their syllabi and links to materials and videos and so Well, we had a buggy learning management system and our tech support was erratic and the vendor's tech support was erratic. And so whenever there was a problem, it became a fire drill. So over time, we replaced that with a more modern system that the students and faculty picked. And we had not one person supporting it, but multiple people supporting it. And then proactively making sure it was updated and tested. And so uh, things just break if you don't proactively work to maintain them. Yeah, you don't you don't want to be the arsonist right. who gets credit for putting out the fire, right? You wanna you wanna be the, the leader right. who prevents the fire from was, happening in uh, the first place. Two thousand nine H one N one swine flu and the president asked, Can we go online? And I said, No, our equipment's eight to ten years old. Our learning management system I just mentioned was buggy. Uh, our email system was 20 years old, custom built. So a student would get a maximum 50 emails, faculty 100. Well, that doesn't scale. And I couldn't even buy the equipment because they never, no longer made it. So over the next seven years, we moved as much of those IT services as we could to the cloud. And when I retired in 2017, my successor um, continued that um, movement to the cloud. And in March 2022, when uh, we had COVID, in two weeks, they increased the VPN, increased Zoom licenses, and 70,000 people went online to study, do research, and work. 
Well, that takes a lot of proactive work, <laughs> proactive thinking. Absolutely. When you've been promoted from a peer with your coworkers to a leader, how do you avoid awkward power dynamics and create a culture of respect within your team along with, with those strong relationships? Peers? Or who were my peers? Well, in general, adv advice for folks who are advice for folks who are maybe just been promoted and dealing with their new role with the um, same people they've worked with I in would the past. Take the time to meet with them and ask what are their goals and aspirations and how can I help you? And here's what I'm trying to achieve and here's how you can help me. It's 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 more than networking. Networking is so superficial and transactional. This is really taking the time to understand what people are trying to achieve. And someone said, well, I don't have time for that. Well, you don't have time not to do it. Because if you don't have those lines of communication open, you're just not as effective. Agreed. You've got to, not only do you have to make time for that, that's got to be your most important job as a leader is making sure you have a good relationship with your team and you're, you're serving them and taking care of their needs. It's not the only thing you need to do, but you, you definitely need to so make I sure that that's at the top of your list. Once a week in their office, I didn't ask him to come to the ivory tower. I would trudge across campus and their teams would see me walking through the workspace. I would say hi and talk to people going through, and then they would see me meeting with their leader. And, and that was happened every week. And I was able to um, demonstrate that I cared. And I asked my direct reports to also um, meet with their peers across campus. So all of us had about 10 relationships that we would maintain every four to six weeks beyond the calendar. We'd meet with these peers and keep those lines of communication open. It was like a, we built a nervous system. We had about 90 to 100 relationships that we were constantly maintaining and, and building. And they became uh, like a nervous system. We would hear um, what's going well. We would ask, uh, we'd tell them, oh, by the way, we're going to change all the phones, 21,000 phones to voice over IP. It's going to be really irritating. <laughs> you know, it's coming in six months, but we're planning ahead. You know, you'll be fine. Um, rumors. Uh, I would meet with a peer and uh, the public safety peer, and he goes, Brad, I heard a rumor that you don't have enough uh, diesel for the generators and the data center. And I said, I said, that's a good rumor. I'll, I'll go check. It turned out that the uh, gener generators were run on natural gas. So it was a great rumor, but it just wasn't true. And he, I was able to get get back to him. And he, he, he I mean, I mean it. You, it happened to be true. Yeah. You, did, you didn't have any diesel. He you was able didn't to, need it. We nipped it in the bud, you know. So it's, uh, it's good to build that, that nervous system. Well, you're always walking the walk and setting the example for the things you talk about uh, in your own career and especially in the book. Now, I do, I do have a question. How does this fit in? What's your take with the big push a lot of companies mm. are making towards return to office? I think it's overblown. It doesn't have to be black and white and one size fits all. Um, I was an equity partner with the firm, Accenture. I didn't have an office. I was either at the client or I would check in hotel style at the office. This was 20 years ago, 25 years ago. So a lot of jobs, you don't necessarily have to be in the office. And I had a team of 90 people for a couple of years who were all over North America. And we would just get on a good old fashioned conference call, the leadership team once a week and keep the lines of communication open. It worked well. And then uh, I would physically go visit each project across the North America. Um, I metaphorically called them my Winnebago tour tours. And I'd meet with my staff. I'd meet with the customer and take them to dinner. And uh, they loved that, that I would 
not only be there virtually, but show up about once a quarter, you know, and physically be there. So I think it's overblown. Yeah, it's, yeah, I agree. It's it's baffling to me why we're not having a conversation about what are all the opportunities we have with people not in the office, because I, I had a similar thing. I had at least two assignments in the Air Force where yeah. we were geographically yeah. distributed, sometimes all over the world doing different projects. And this was this was back before smartphones. So there was no Slack. We had email, but most of the time, the people working on our team were out somewhere where at best... They could find a payphone to talk to us at the beginning of the day and the end of the day and let us know how things were going. And of course, it was all classified, yeah. so we couldn't speak really openly about things anyway. So if we can make that happen, we don't need to have people sitting in front of us doing work on computers. We can we can find opportunities for them to do more important things right, and right. achieve better and higher outcomes. All right. Well, let's take a break okay. from these formal questions and play a little bit of a game. So this game is called Rapid Response. I'm going to ask you a series of questions. I want you to respond with the first thing that pops into your head. Now, it doesn't need to be a one-word answer. Take as long as you need to to really get the point across. Let us know what you're thinking. But what we want you to do is okay. come, come with the first thing that pops into your head, okay? All right. Brad Englert, Rapid Response Round. Your time starts now. There's a podcast NPR recommendation. podcast called Two Guys on Your Head, and they explore human behavior in the brain. Uh, two uh, PhDs from UT Austin, Art Markman and Bob Duke, and they're just fun and interesting uh, topics. Well, it sounds like that would be right up our audience's alley. Best tip for building a relationship with someone um, you just met? Meet with them in their space, ask what they're trying to achieve, and talk about how you can help. And if you can, talk about how you might know someone who can help them. <laughs> I, I don't think it could be said any better than that. Something we should I all think, be paying attention uh, artificial to. Artificial intelligence. I think it's going to dramatically change. We're not there yet, early days, but I think it's going to uh, fundamentally change how we work and uh, similar to the internet. All right. Okay. Now, don't answer right away. Let me finish the question. Your Get Psyched Up song or... Well, your walk on music. There is a relatively new artist who has exploded onto the scene. Her name is Maggie Rogers. And I actually saw her in an Austin City Limits taping. And she has the most beautiful voice. And the producer of the show said she could sing a menu and you'd cry. <laughs> and so she has a, a song out now, Don't Forget Me. That's the most beautiful uh, music I've ever, it's just beautiful. Yeah. All right, Maggie Rogers, don't forget me. Check it out, everybody. Your biggest influence oh, in life. A book <laughs> everyone should well, read besides I love yours. Stephen Covey and his Seven Habits. It's such a classic. And at the firm, we were required to go through uh, Covey Seven Habits training. But just some of the principles begin with the end in mind. Uh, the concept of an emotional bank account with your customer. Are you making deposits or are you making withdrawals? Um, sharpening the saw, continually to develop your uh, capabilities. It's just so simple, uh, but uh, really helps you to be a proactive uh, person and not a reactive person. Everyone loves the classics. Go check them out if you don't know Stephen Covey. Best Halloween oh, candy. I think Snickers. <laughs> Good choice. Um, Your next vacation. My wife has a class she's taking in Tuscany 
and she's asked me to come along. So we're going to Italy in the spring. <laughs> well, that sounds like a really rough gig. I uh, I feel for you. I'm uh, I'm empathetic to your uh, to your situation here. Besi besides AI, I think an important trend to watch. Um, you know, the bad guys are going to start using AI to crack into things uh, they already have. They're going to start using quantum computing that's going to crack encryption. So I'm, uh, I think that's the other thing. I mean, how many times has your information been released by a telephone company? <laughs> yeah, I probably had five breaches in the last year. And so I think you got to keep, be aware of that. Yeah, we, uh, we definitely need to all be paying attention to cybersecurity and we definitely all need to think about how some things that we're really, really used to need to change and the so we can deep, protect ourselves and each other. Fakes. I mean, they're Favorite? more prevalent. You could get a, a call and the voice sounds like your daughter and she's in jail and needs to be bailed out. You know, it's, it's pretty scary. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry. Oh, Favorite sports, sports team? team. Well, you know, the Texas Favorite, Longhorns. In spite of the game team. last Saturday, uh, the Longhorns are uh, on the upswing. Yeah, they. Uh, I think they're they're looking As the to, chief information to have a pretty, officer, pretty, pretty good I had year, the so, all access uh, pass to the stadium, and so I could get out on the field with Matthew McConaughey and and my sound guys and my uh, security guys, and uh, I said hi to the sound guy, and he goes, "Okay, don't touch anything." <laughs> like I would touch anything. <laughs> Any uh, any professional relationship building tips <laughs> you got be from loyal Matthew McConaughey? To your team. <laughs> it so sounds like something he would say. That's yeah. a that's a fantastic book too, Green Lights. So, all right. Well, thank you for playing our game. It's always fun to get to know people a little bit away from the the leadership and business questions we ask. So, thanks for playing. Thanks for being a good sport. Now. Moving from Accenture to the university, what's the one thing about leadership you didn't expect to discover? Um, I, in a, a kind of a mistake and a growing moment, I trusted people at the university who shouldn't have been trusted uh, at a peer level. And I just generally trust people. That's kind of the culture of the firm was that way. And I learned to be more aware of that people are not always truthful. So someone who's overly nice, someone who gossips about others, because you know they're gossiping to others about you, um, they never take accountability. Um, they're great at sucking up to the, their boss, um, who sometimes is your boss. So I, I became much more aware of uh, not trusting everything that said. Yeah, and that's not to say don't trust people at all, but sometimes we need to re-examine whether we should take things at face value all the time, right? Absolutely. So... Lately, the last couple of episodes, we've had a lot of technologists on the show, AI folks with, uh, you know, founders of AI companies, founders of robotics companies. You're no exception. How do we prepare our teams for the transition to a workplace where humans work side by side with robots and well, artificial think, intelligence? Um, working with your staff to incorporate the new tools. Um, it needs to be a collaborative effort, so you can't top-down force it, but um, working with your staff to say, here are the tools, how, how do you think we can best take advantage of them is really the best way to go. You have to have their, their buy-in, and they're closest to the work anyhow. You don't really know at that level how it can be helpful or not.
Yeah, that's what I've found in all these conversations over the last year ish, year and a half ish or so is a lot of people are really reluctant to embrace the new technology. And then when you start having the conversation about how can this how can this help you meet right. your goals better and how can it free you up to do things you want to do but don't have time to do, they right. they really start to go, Oh, now yeah. I see it. So so what are the important qualities that employers should be looking for when they're hiring to bring people the on their teams? Desire to learn new things. Yeah, we're in constant there's constant change and to have employees who want to learn new things and, you know, take some calculated risks. I think uh, that's most important. Yeah. Risk, risk taking is an interesting one, right? I, I think every team's <laughs> got people who are completely unafraid to take risk and then people who are really risk averse and, and it takes, it it takes a lot of learning. It takes a lot and a lot of uh, on both sides to get people to look at managing risk and embracing risk, and kind of re resist their natural inclinations on things. It's it's a very interesting dynamic. I with, without really working with people, it's hard to find any middle well, ground. It just comes with some training and some experience. About a third of your uh, let's say customer base wants to try something new. The other third are kind of watching to see if they get killed or not. <laughs> then the other third are don't want to change. So when we were moving to a new email system or moving to a new learning management system or changing all the phones, I had a third that would leap to try it out. And then as they were successful, the ones in the middle would come along. And then finally, the reluctant would say, oh, that's really working out well. And they would come along, you know, it might take a year or two, but um, I take advantage of those who want to take the risks and let them come up with solutions that can then help the whole organization. Yeah, sometimes you got to let people find their own way. Um, I, I call it the velvet rope thing, right? We're going to we're going to let a couple of people have this yeah. now. You guys can have it later. And then when they see how great it's working for the people who've got it, they 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 flip right. from I yeah. never want it to I want it now. So if there was one leadership trait you wish you could instantly transfer to everyone, what is it and why is it um, goes so back vital? to the title of the book, create and nurture authentic business relationships. Take the time to do that. It's not that hard. And you don't have, just start with one. You know, start with your boss and uh, you know, on a Monday, just have the dialogue, but, you know, build those relationships that last sometimes years and decades. Well, once again, you're walking the walk for all of us that you're, you're telling us to follow in the book. I think that's fantastic. So it's been a pretty great year for you. What's the next big milestone you're driving towards and what are the obstacles you see in well, your way that you I, need to overcome? Um, I love doing these podcasts. I've enjoyed our discussion today. It's been a lot of fun. So I'll continue to do podcasting. I'm working on a half-day workshop that I could do either virtually or in person to help teams learn how to build these skills. Uh, you don't have to be born with the ability to build relationships, but you need to understand how to do it. And so uh, the workshop would have some role playing, would have some... Uh, just storytelling, um, have people talk about their experience. So I'm, uh, for example, there's a multinational software company that had the sales team leader said, I need my sales people to build relationships. Can you come help us do that? And so he'll probably be my uh, test drive for the workshop. So I'm looking forward to that. I like um, helping people grow in their career. Sounds fantastic. And well, when you have that up and oh, running, come back on the That'd podcast and we'll help you promote that. Now, we've all made mistakes, but what's the best mistake you've ever made? And how did it end up being a game changer for you I think and your teams? Being better at setting and managing expectations. So I had a client who 
had this multi-year transformational project. It was kind of in the ditch and they asked me to take over. And I said, I know we'll be successful. Uh, this was in October. I said, I'm happy to help, uh, looking forward to it. However, next June, I have a trip planned to Australia. And I was an exchange student there in high school. I go back every four or five years with the family. I was supposed to go last year, but it was, it was my 25th reunion of, of the high school. I couldn't go, I canceled it. So my I have bought the plane tickets, we have the passports. Next June, I need to take three weeks and go to Australia. And they said, oh, that's fine. You know, the, no problem. So this was the provost and the CFO, no problem. So we get to April, made a, achieved a big milestone, got to May, we're meeting with the president. Uh, Mr. President, just wanted to remind you, as I have the last three months, I'm going to Australia in June, uh, Diane will be in charge. And his hand started shaking. He was nervous. And I'm slow-mo saying, Whoa, canceling my vacation. And the CFO and provost said, stop, Brad, stop. Uh, Mr. President, when Brad joined us in October, he told us about this vacation. It's very important for him and his family. We committed to let him do that. He says it's the best time to go. We should let him go. So my client defended my vacation. Fast forward 10 years, I'm having dinner with the chief financial officer and our spouses, and we talked about that. And you know what he said? He said, we were scared to death when you were gone. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's one of the reasons you want to, you don't want to be too indispensable to the team and you want to make sure your team is yeah. well prepared to handle things when you're gone. So you have led not just UT, but you've helped other big organizations go through major transitions. And that's that couldn't have been easy all the time. So when adversity hits, how do you stay calm and centered? What's your secret for leading with resilience in um, high stakes situations? Slowing down, not leaping to solutions, but actually taking the time to step back with your team and say, do we really understand what the crisis is and how we're going to fix it? One of my direct reports read the copy of the manuscript and she reminded me that I would slow her down and make her think about, you know, she was leaping to the solution right away. And she appreciated the fact that we would slow down and actually think, think about what is the real problem and how can we best solve it? Slow down. Great advice. I had people telling me for the first 10 years of my Air Force career that I needed to slow down. And it probably took, it probably took 10 or 12 years for me to finally to finally get to the point where I, I wasn't slowing right. down, but at least I was learning to tell myself to slow down. That's right. And then instead of having to be told by somebody else. So what keeps you up at night? What are the big challenges you're facing well, right now? The, How are uh, you handling goes that? goes back to the cybersecurity issue. Um, you know, I worry about, uh, you know, a bad guy breaking in. At the university, we were attacked 24-7, 365 days uh, from state actors, from Eastern European cartels. Um, we had our defense work actually had a moat around it, meaning no connection to the Internet. <laughs> Why? Because bad guys can get in. So I just worry about um, personally, you know, someone uh, doing some bad things, but in, in, in society, you know, I worry about the, the deep fakes and things like that. I'm sure you got a little, uh, got a few attacks <laughs> you know, from Texas A&M actually, as well, because I know IT, they don't like you guys very much. We actually worked very well together. We just didn't tell anybody. And we built a statewide network from Austin to Dallas to College Station, Houston to Austin at 100 gigabits per second, which is as fast as you could go. And that connected all the high-performance supercomputers to all the campuses. 
and had redundant coverage to internet too. So we built that with the Aggies. We just didn't tell anyone. <laughs> Uh, pro probably wise because people who are watching this right now, they're, uh, they're, uh, the football <laughs> fans all across Texas, their hearts are breaking right now, I think. So, uh, my last assignment in the air force was in Alabama. So I didn't go to a big state school like that. That was a big oh, football yeah. school, but I definitely understand the dynamic of fans from the university of Alabama, mm -hmm. Auburn rivalry. I lived that for almost three <laughs> years and it was, it was eye opening to me. So what's, so what's the one thing you're most excited about in the near future? What innovation is going to change the game for all of us? I think that we're barely scratching the surface. Yeah, I think, uh, I think there's, uh, I agree. I think uh, we've all found ways and things for AI to do for us. I don't even think we've begun right. to find how it's going to change our lives and keep us focused on the big picture while it does a lot of the work that took humans a lot of time book, and effort. The to do. Uh, copyright says, so it what's your, cannot be consumed by a, uh, training an AI machine. <laughs> I don't know if that'll help or not. But... Yeah, that's, that's, that's actually in the copyright on your book. That is, I, I, I mean, I understand why well, I just hadn't heard that anyone was doing that. that that's very, that's very smart and forward looking. So, cause I know there's a bunch of people going through legal, legal trouble right now of right. where people have said, Hey, I didn't authorize you yeah, to use I, I my, my content it. for your training. So, <laughs> and that's something we're going to figure out as we go. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we, we have pretty strong and I think effective copyright and intellectual property laws in this country. We just need to figure out, you know, just, yeah. just like when the internet started in the nineties for all of us outside of the university system and the defense, the defense establishment, it's, right. it can't be a complete free for all as much fun as that is. So, so for all our future leaders watching, what's your best piece of advice for someone who's looking to build strong and lasting human connections in the future of the workplace? Give me some advice when I got to the university, 40 year professor, kind of a cr crusty guy. And I asked for advice. And you know what he said? He said, get out of the office and tell people you give a damn. That's the advice I would give. As, as true today as when you first got there and when I became a, became a lieutenant in the Air Force, when they told us all the same thing is get out from behind your desk and see what people are doing and get to know them. So, and I, uh, I think that, I think that advice has yeah. been going well, on someone for said, well, Brad, at least a hundred common years. Sense, but not everyone has common sense. <laughs> that's right. And, and that's why you have a book that people are buying. Is there, a, is there anything else no, you want to leave I, us with uh, that I haven't asked you, Brad? I really enjoyed, enjoyed the podcast. Great. Great. Well, the book is Spheres of Influence. How to Create and Nurture Authentic Business Relationships. It's an Amazon bestseller in three categories, so go get it. Brad, tell everyone where they can reach uh, you and especially where they can uh, get the book. LinkedIn is easy. And also uh, the books on Amazon, just type in Brad Englert and it'll pop up. And I have a website, uh, www.bradenglert.com. Excellent. Well, I enjoyed reading the book. I've got more to go. I didn't finish it yet, but I'm going to get to it. I've really enjoyed reading it. Thank you for the copy. And thank you for joining us today, Brad. Thank you, all of you who are watching for tuning in. And if you liked what Brad had to say, please reach out to him and thank him for joining us. Also, check out some of our other videos and please like, comment, share, and subscribe to the channel. It helps us out so much, especially if you leave us a five-star review. We love sharing these conversations with you. So keep watching, keep developing your leader's mindset onward and upward.